many, 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 many lives depend upon this. This year was essentially the first year that it hit uh, and we're finally beginning to actually see it, feel it, taste it, understand it, and understand that we have to do something very, very quickly. Ed has completely transformed the way that designers get to think of themselves as activists and as change makers. He has changed the tone and the, 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 the language and the conversation around the built environment and climate change for the last 20 years and really was the first and foremost person to do that on a large scale. The mark of a true leader is to turn around and look and see who's following. Uh, and we are all following Ed. Ed, instead of saying, let's build these masterpieces, he what he said was, let's combine architecture, uh, design, design and uh, art with science. So we submitted some papers to a conference on how to design uh, using passive systems. Uh, how, do you, how do you let design actually uh, through that process, heat and naturally heat and cool uh, and ventilate uh, uh, buildings in all climates. And so we developed um, those, those processes, uh, presented them at this conference. Uh, and then um, at that time, I came back to New Mexico and put it all in a book, the Passive Solar Energy book, and published it in 1979. And it kind of became the text for how to design um, all passive solar systems. That's kind of where it all started. I met Ed at the 1976 Passive Solar Conference in Philadelphia. He became a major and central figure in the passive solar movement as of that conference in 76. After the book was published uh, in 79, we opened up a practice in New Mexico. Most of our work that came in, people have read the book, everybody was excited about these systems. Um, by that time, the energy crisis was over, but in New Mexico, um, there was still tremendous interest in natural systems. He put me up in a little solar house that he's, he designed in the early years. It was a lovely little house, uh, very unassuming, but very nice, nicely landscaped. And I slept over in that house. And he said, uh, take a look at the wall. And it was a trom wall, which is uh, 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 this technical solution of gathering the sun's energy and uh, not light, but power and uh, warmth. And so the house had this trom wall. And at night when the desert cooled down, I was warmed by that wall as never in my life have I ever been. It was totally comfortable. It was like the most organic warmth I have ever felt. And to me, that's the magic of architecture. And frankly, that's the magic of Ed. Climate change was in the headlines. So I built out a chart and looked at the building sector, what we were responsible for. And lo and behold, in the US, we were responsible for about almost half of all CO2 emissions. And here we were focused on SUVs and the architecture and the building sector, buildings, building operations was half of all emissions. And that's how we discovered uh, this issue. We wrote an article, gave it to Metropolis Magazine. They made a cover issue out of it. It's called the Architects Pollute Issue. And he deconstructed the carbon pie chart, which leaned toward uh, the automotive and the transportation industries. And the architecture was never part of it. So because he has this knowledge of what goes on uh, in building and what goes on with wasting things and shipping things and manufacturing things, he, he uh, uh, added all up and uh, made, it, made, it, made us see that the architecture world is producing about 48% of all carbon in the United States, more. And so at the end of 2005, um, we issued the 2030 challenge which was an incremental reduction in CO2 emissions in designing buildings 
Well, the AIA uh, immediately uh, picked it up and um, said, uh, you know, we need to do we need to do this. At the time, I was about halfway through my graduate degree program at Columbia University, and I thought, wow, here is an architect that is really thinking outside the box. Um, that's thinking beyond single buildings or physical construction to the really awesome potential of our profession. Historically, GDP, building square footage, energy consumption, and emissions all go up together since the beginning of this country, since the, you know, up until 2005. So they're all going up together. What happens in 2005? They stop and decouple. Buildings, square footage keeps going up, GDP keeps going up, construction keeps going up, energy consumption in the whole sector doesn't go up, and emissions doesn't go up in 2005. It stops on a dime like that. We issued the 2030 targets. And then what happens? Emissions from 2005 to today start to go down. And today they're 30% below 2005 levels. We will easily get to about a 60 to 70%, 65 to 70% reduction by 2030 and phase out CO2 emissions in the entire building sector by the year 2040. None of us can do this alone. It's so important for everyone in our industry to join us uh, whether it's operational and maintenance long-term costs, resilience and reducing future risks, brand reputation, or thinking about you know, your own talent or the culture of your organization, those are all things that business owners, developers, uh, governments can get behind. Um, and it's just speaking their language uh, to help them understand that their goals are the same as our goals. Our clients don't tell us uh, so they, they want a good building, they want a well-designed building, they want you to bring it in on budget. But they don't tell us how to site the building. We decide how to site the building. We decide its orientation. We specify pretty much everything in a building. But the big decisions that decide the energy consumption and the emissions of a building are really left to us. Somehow, he manages to look at all of that scary data and take all of these complicated, messy, dynamic, interactive elements that are working together to both create and potentially solve this problem. And not only is able to distill them down and understand this landscape in the way that he can just, you know, say exactly what needs to be done here and exactly what needs to be done there in some pretty simple, clear ways. But he is able to do so with what I have come to realize is genuine optimism. It's not it's not fake, it's not naive, it's reality-based optimism. Really, really pleased when Ed Masria won the AIA Gold Medal. The highest award really you can get in the field. Love it. I love the gold medal for Ed. Ed, Ed I look at as not an ordinary architect because of what he's done and what he's contributed with his scientific knowledge. He actually teaches you things. and. To me, that was one of the, that was the most important part of uh, getting to know him because I knew I was going to learn something. I knew I was going to see the world in a different way than I have ever did before. And I couldn't wait to see it. Yeah, receiving the, the, um, the AIA gold medal was really for me an affirmation of all of the people who have been involved, that I've been involved with. This validates everything that we've been talking about and working towards for the last 40 years. The gold medal uh, recognizes influence in our profession. Uh, and I can't think of another person more deserving than Ed Masria. He never gave up, he never stopped beating that drum. Uh, and I am so thrilled and proud of the AIA um, to have really stepped up to the challenge and helped him lead these efforts.